Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the McGowan Theater, located in the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. I'm Doug Swanson, Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum, as well as producer for the Noontime Lecture Series. Before we begin today's program, I'd just like to remind you of a couple other programs we've got coming to this theater in the next few days. Tomorrow evening, June 19th at 7 p.m., we'll be hosting the 2015 AFI Docs Guggenheim Symposium, honoring award-winning filmmaker Stanley Nelson. The symposium will feature a series of excerpts from Nelson's body of work, and he will be joined by Washington Post film critic Anne Hornaday to discuss his career. On Saturday, June 20th at 2 p.m., we'll be screening the Charles Chaplin film, City Lights. The screening will be introduced by Chaplin scholar and author of Chaplin and American Culture, Dr. Charles uh, Milland. And please don't forget about our annual July 4th celebration. That includes the dramatic reading of the Declaration of Independence on the Constitution Avenue steps starting at 10 a.m. Special guests will include Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin, amongst others. Also, special July 4th hands-on family activities will take place in the Boeing Learning Center from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., so please mark your calendars. To find out more about these and our other programs, as well as our exhibits, uh, please take one of our monthly event calendars, which you'll find in the racks in the theater lobby, or you can visit our website at www.archives.gov calendar. Our topic for today is Nixon's Nuclear Specter, the Secret Alert of 1969, Madman Diplomacy and the Vietnam War by William Burr and Jeffrey Kimball. Dr. William Burr is a senior analyst at the National Security Archive and directs the Archive's Nuclear History Documentation Project. He edited two of the archive's document collections, The Berlin Crisis, 1958 to 1962, and U.S. Nuclear History, Nuclear Arms and Politics in the Missile Age, 1955 to 1968. He received his Ph.D. in history from Northern Illinois University, was formerly a visiting assistant professor at Washington College, and has taught at the Catholic University of America, George Mason, and American Universities. In 1998, he published his critically acclaimed document reader, The Kissinger Transcripts, The Top Secret Talks with Beijing and Moscow. His reviews and articles have appeared in Diplomatic History, International Security, and Cold War History, among others. During 1996 to 1998, he served as the, or on the editorial board of Diplomatic History. He is currently a member of the Council for the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations and previously served as Freedom of Information Act coordinator for the archive. Dr. Jeffrey Kimball is Professor Emeritus of History at Miami University in Ohio. He received his BA from the University of New Orleans, his MA from Queens University, Ontario, and his PhD from Louisiana State University. He has taught courses and been the author of books, journals, and book chapters on foreign relations, war, alternatives to war, War Termination, Popular Culture, and history, Historiography from the Late 18th Century to the Vietnam and Afghanistan Wars. His books are To Reason Why, the debut about the causes of American involvement in the Vietnam War, Nixon's Vietnam War, which was a history book club selection, received the Robert Farrell Book Prize and the Ohio Academy of History Book, Pro, or book Award, and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize and The Vietnam War Files, Uncovering the Secret History of Nixon-Era Strategy, which won the Arthur Link Warren Cool Prize. Two of his articles on the War of 1812 has, have also won, uh, won awards. Kimball has served as the graduate director of the Miami University History Department, associate editor for the journal Diplomatic History, president of the Peace History Society, and chair of the Peace History Commission of the International Peace History Association. He was a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Nobel Institute in 1995 and a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in 2001. Please join me in welcoming William Burr and Jeffrey Kimball to the National Archives. Uh, thank you, Doug, for your introduction, and thank you all for showing up on this hot and steamy day. Uh, but in a very nice, cool venue, so it's, everybody wins. Um, I will start first summarizing the subject matter and the themes of our book, and Jeff will then address what we think is new and significant about the book. 
While attempting to give you a good sense of what the book is about, we will try to be as brief as possible to make time for your questions. First, however, I will give some background on how this book came about. Our collaboration on this project began some years ago. We had both read Seymour Hersh's book, The Price of Power, and became aware of a mysterious Strategic Air Command alert in October 1969. We wanted to learn, we wanted to learn more about it, its apparent connection to the Vietnam War, and the role of the, the, role of the Nixon White House in the decisions. <clears throat> Though he had complementary research and writing interests, made, made all the difference for this project. Jeff had written a, book on the, a major book on Nixon and the Vietnam War, while I was working on US nuclear history documentation, and had written on Henry Kissinger's role in government. We both did more research, and eventually had enough source material to write an article about the relationship between the alert and Nixon's Vietnam War policy. The article was published in Cold War History, historical journal, uh, Cold War History, in early 2003. Later, with more sources becoming available, we decided that there was enough information to justify a book on the October alert and, and to place it in its larger context. As we were writing, we could take into account surprising newly declassified information about Nixon's Vietnam policy. Even the last year or two, documents were becoming declassified that were most important to supporting the interpretation that we were developing. What we wrote is a book about the Vietnam War policy and strategy of Richard Nixon during his first year in office, 1969, and his use of madman diplomacy to try to end the war quickly on his terms. It was an effort that culminated in the secret nuclear alert of that same year. The title was taken from a comment Nixon made in a telephone conversation with his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, on March 8, 1969, in regard to their Vietnam strategy. Nixon said, the main thing is we must hold up the specter of pressures for hitting the North. To unravel the intricate story of the October nuclear alert, and to explain its background, we drew upon extensive research and archival sources, participant interviews, and recently declassified documents. We placed our story, we placed our story in several contexts. An important part of the context is nuclear threat making and coercive diplomacy during the Cold War from 1945 to the late 1960s. It was during this period that Nixon and Kissinger developed their worldviews about diplomacy, military affairs, and revolution, including the long-running, anti-colonial, then post-colonial revolution in Vietnam. It was also in this period, during and after his association with President Dwight D. Eisenhower and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, that then Vice President Nixon and post-Vice President Nixon Nixon developed his madman strategy in, in this context. For example, from Eisenhower, Nixon learned about the role of military threats in diplomacy and the possibility of threatening nuclear weapons use. Eisenhower claimed that he settled the Korean War by using secret channels to convey nuclear threats to Moscow and Beijing. Now, these claims are historically dubious, but they had a significant impact on Nixon's thinking as did Eisenhower's continued use of nuclear threats during the 1950s crises, including the two sta Taiwan Strait crises and the Lebanon crisis of 1958. Also relevant to the context are developments uh, in elite thinking about nuclear strategy and nuclear war, the popular culture of the bomb, bureaucratic infighting, domestic politics, the anti-war movement, and international diplomacy, including Vietnamese, and South and Soviet actions and policies. Also part of the context is the international nuclear taboo, which has operated as a powerful informal constraint against the military use of nuclear weapons. Now here's a short synopsis of the book. When Richard Nixon came to power in January 1969, his top priority was bringing an end to US military involvement in Vietnam. At the outset, Nixon and Kissinger believed that it would be possible to end the war quickly in their favor with military force and coercive diplomacy. But yet they were not seeking military victory. Like Lyndon Johnson's wise men, they did not think it possible to defeat Hanoi in any meaningful or cost-effective sense. Coercing Hanoi's forces out of the South was virtually impossible, and Nixon and Kissinger realized that they could not guarantee the future of the Saigon regime. But they hoped to get better terms for a U.S. exit from Vietnam 
by backing up diplomacy towards Moscow and Hanoi with a madman strategy and threatening excessive or extraordinary force, including the specter of nuclear use. For example, Kissinger wrote to Nixon about the importance of influencing Moscow's Vietnam policy by trying to make the Soviets worry that the president was getting out of control. Now, Nixon and Kissinger began in 1969 with verbal threats that in mid-March bombed North Vietnamese and Viet Cong bases in Cambodia, signaling that there was more to come. As the bombing expanded, they launched a secret mining ruse to raise the specter, to raise the threat, I'm sorry, to raise the threat of mining operations against Haiphong Harbor. For example, U.S. aircraft carriers carried out mining exercises in the Philippines' Subic Bay. Somehow it was thought that Chinese or Soviet intelligence would notice these activities and pass the word on to Hanoi. All this thinking and planning took place in the deepest of secrecy, not only from the U.S. public, but also from the foreign policy bureaucracy, especially the State Department. Seeking maximum freedom of action and fearing leaks, Nixon and Kissinger held their thinking closely so that only a few close advisors knew the actual direction of policy. But because their secret signals and military operations failed to sway Moscow or Hanoi, by midsummer, Nixon and Kissinger stepped up their warnings and initiated planning for a massive shock and awe mining and bombing military operation slated for early November 1969. This plan was referred to within the White House, within the White House inner, within the White House inner circles, as Duck Hook. But the Joint Chiefs of Staff, their plan was called uh, Pruning Knife. Together, both plans were known as the November Option. Now, beyond the, beyond the mining of North Vietnamese ports and the selective bombing of targets in the Hanoi area, the concept for Duck Hook initially included proposals for U.S. and South Vietnamese U.S. and South Vietnamese ground incursions into the north, the bombing of dikes, and tactical nuclear strikes against logistic targets. So all options were on the table for a, for a point, for a period. In early, November, in early October, however, Nixon shortened planning for the long contemplated operation. He had been influenced by Hanoi's defiance in the face of his dire threats, and was concerned about U.S. public reactions to escalation. He was concerned about anti-war protests and internal administration dissent. So instead of, instead of the November option and escalation, Nixon and Kissinger launched a secret global nuclear alert in the hope that it would lend credibility to their earlier warnings and threats, and perhaps even persuade Moscow into putting pressure on its, on its client Hanoi. It was to be what, what President Nixon called a special reminder of how far he might go officially referred to as the JCS, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the JCS Readiness Test. It was the equivalent of a worldwide nuclear alert. It was intended to signal Washington's anger at Moscow's support of Hanoi and to jar the Soviet leadership into using their leverage to induce their ally to make diplomatic concessions. Carried out between October 13th and October 30th, the readiness test involved military operations around the world the continental United States, Western Europe, the Middle East, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Sea of Japan. The activities included higher readiness levels for SAC bombers and for tactical air, and a variety of naval maneuvers from movements of aircraft carriers and submarine launched uh, submarine and uh, aircraft carriers and ballistic missile submarines to the shadowing of Soviet merchant ships sailing towards Haiphong. The alert culminated with nuclear-armed B-52 bombers flying over northern Alaska for several days. Although kept secret from the American public and most of the government, some elements of the readiness test were noticed around the world, including neighborhoods near SAC bases and on ports in the Pacific and Western Europe. Within the U.S. government, secrecy created confusion because such activities as, a, as the abrupt sailing of ships at port were unusual and unexplained. For example, the sudden departure of the aircraft carrier the Yorktown from Rotterdam Harbor left 200 baffled sailors behind, and the U.S. defense attaché had to scramble to find ways to get the 200 sailors by helicopter back to the carrier. But no one knew why they were left behind. As Nixon and Kissinger uh, hoped, the Soviet took note of the unusual U.S. activity 
and responded with low-level precautionary uh, actions. Defense Intelligence and the National Security Agency collected information about what were thought to be Soviet reactions uh, to the alert. But the reports are heavily uh, sanitized because they draw upon highly secret signals intelligence information. So most of the information is still uh, classified to this day. It remains to be learned, however, what exactly Moscow made of the alert, especially where the Soviet leaders understood the message that Nixon and Kissinger were trying to convey. What is known is that the risky gambit failed to meet the risky gambit failed to move the Soviets, and its failure marked a turning point in the administration's strategy for exiting from Vietnam. Nixon and Kissinger became increasingly resigned to a long route policy of providing Saigon with a decent chance of survival for a decent interval after a negotiated settlement and U.S. forces had left Southeast Asia. Uh, we provide an epilogue that, that includes a discussion of the aftermath of Nixon and Kissinger's failed threats and an analysis of their policies and strategies during the, remainder, during the remaining years of the American war in Vietnam. As we show, the madman theory, the madman strategy, remained basic to Nixon's and Kissinger's conduct and major crises and in, the, and in the Vietnam War endgame in 1972. Now, Jeff will now speak about what is uh, especially significant and new about our book. Well, thank you. Well, thanks for coming out. Um, and thanks again to Doug Swanson for uh, arranging all this and uh, being very hospitable. Uh, I'll briefly uh, uh, talk about what is new, we think, and significant about the book. New information or interpretations to be found in the book, as well as what we believe constitutes a significant addition to our understanding of the topics we are writing about. Uh, I will also uh, make note of a few things that were known before but not fully understood, as well as uh, those that were not known before but which we now know. So in other words, I'll be talking about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. As Bill explained, the book uh, is a copiously documented account of Nixon's secret nuclear alert, uh, which updates and f fills out uh, a briefer account we published in 2003 in uh, the journal Cold War History. Uh, much of the new documentation has never before been seen or cited by anyone else. Um, tangentially, I should also point out the odd fact that uh, the year 1969 in Nixon, the Nixon phase of the Vietnam War was probably heretofore the least documented period of, uh, of uh, the Nixon uh, war in Vietnam. Uh, so we, we are uh, compensating. We are, uh, we are now filling that out with much more documentation, that story. Uh, in addition to being a well-sourced account of the Nixon phase of the Vietnam War in 1969, uh, we believe uh, it contributes new information and many new insights about certain themes and topics, which I will mention briefly. Among the important themes and topics are, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the nuclear threat making from early 1945, which we thought was needed to put uh, the Nixon-Kissinger alert of 69 in context. Um, I should add, however, in, in mentioning that, that that chapter one, I think, Bill, I, if, I, I don't know if we talked about this, but I think it's probably uh, the uh, first concise documented survey of known episodes of nuclear threat making and near misses during this early period uh, with substantial documentation. Regarding the nuclear taboo, which is another topic Bill mentioned and which we uh, discuss, um, that receives extensive discussion in the book, but suffice it to say here, in addition to what Bill said, the taboo is an informal but widely held prohibition against the use of nuclear weapons that came about during the years after the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the onset of the nuclear arms race. Uh, 
It consists in moral, political, practical, bureaucratic, and technical considerations and strictures. During the past 70 years, 70 years, these have functioned to prevent the use of nuclear weapons. Although it appears that Nixon and Kissinger were tempted to use such weapons in Vietnam, the taboo functioned to restrain them, although it did not prevent them from threatening the use of nuclear weapons. But continuing with the list of what we think is new and significant, the book demonstrates that military operations Nixon launched earlier in 1969 led willy-nilly to the October alert. The point I'm trying to make here is that escalated military measures that you may be familiar with were all of a piece. They all failed to intimidate the Soviets or the North Vietnamese for the purposes Nixon and Kissinger wanted, but each failure led to another escalation until the nuclear alert. And I don't know that that sense of the connectedness of these operations is, uh, is uh, comprehended widely. So as Bill mentioned, these operations uh, included the secret bombing of Cambodia, which began in mid-March 1969. It was followed by the U.S. Navy mining ruse launched in the spring of 1969. Uh, the ruse, or feint, continued for months uh, from the spring of 1969 through the summer and is revealed for the first time in our book. It, in turn, led to the drafting of a Navy plan in late July to actually mine North Vietnam. Its code name was Duck Hook. Now, some of you may be familiar with that code name, uh, but we think we are the first historians, is that still true, who, who discovered the actual plan, a mining-only plan, U.S. Navy plan, uh, drafted in July. So the, the name Duck Hook, we have no clue as to why that code name was chosen, but uh, the, the name many of you may know, Duck Hook, first was used with that mining only plan of July. However, it soon morphed into a mining and bombing concept projected to be launched in early November, as Bill mentioned, should Hanoi re uh, 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 resist U.S. demands. The concept came in two versions, the duck hook version and the pruning knife version. The duck hook name was unofficial. It was a name, a vestigial name, probably left over from that mining only plan about which some of Kissinger's aides knew. And so they applied that name to the new plan they were developing. And actually by, by October, on one of the uh, documents we have of that concept plan, someone has written in, in a script, Duck Hook, indicating that indeed that name was applied, but it was unofficial. But in preparing for this operation, the military had to be brought in and a group was formed. They collected in Saigon and the code name they gave to their uh, work was Pruning Knife, as Bill mentioned. This, this was very confusing for a while. What, what, what was the difference between those two plants? But it was really that Kissinger's group was working on the concept. It was a certain kind of concept to use military force in order to achieve diplomatic and political ends. And uh, the military was instructed to come up with operations to accomplish that. Uh, one of the problems, the main problem that developed, however, was that the views of the JCS group and the JCS itself was, was that they wanted the plan to be more doctrinally pure. They wanted it to be aimed at achieving military objectives, not so much political objectives. And, and this, in the end, would be one of the reasons that the November option was not carried out, in part because the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not like the plan. 
we can, uh, continuing with a list of what's new and so forth, we can confirm the rumor that one early duck hook mining and bombing concept plan in September had recommendations for the use of tactical nuclear weapons against logistics targets, three uh, targets um, uh, uh, against passes, uh, supply passes on the Laos, Laos North Vietnam border, one of which was probably the oft-mentioned Mujia Pass. And another attack with nuclear weapons would be against two railroad links to China. In the book, we also present a well-documented explanation of why Nixon canceled the contemplated November mining and bombing operation, uh, popularly but unofficially known as Doug Hook. Among the several causes of his decision, we confirm that his concern about forthcoming anti-war demonstrations in October and November, long a contested issue in the historiography of the war, uh, was an important contributory cause. Uh, there was a telephone conversation between Nixon and Kissinger in which Nixon is expressing his uh, fears that the operation, should it be carried out in early November, would have followed the October 15th moratorium. And he was worried that somehow the North Vietnamese and the Russians would think that he was attacking them because of that demonstration. I'm not quite sure why that concerned him, but uh, he was worried about that. And then he was concerned that if the operation was carried out in early November, that the mid-November moratorium and new mobilization uh, demonstration would turn into a much larger demonstration and uh, undermine all of his intended uh, purposes of uh, swaying the Soviets. Um, but there were other causes. Uh, Nixon was very concerned about holding public support for the operation within the six month period they thought it would take to succeed, if it could succeed, and they weren't certain about that. Uh, there was also Laird's opposition to escalation, Melvin Laird, Secretary of Defense. Uh, even Kissinger's aides were critical of the plan for various reasons, its impracticality or its dangers. Um, another reason uh, why uh, Nixon backed off from the plan was Hanoi's refusal to yield in the face of threats that the administration was making. Another reason was Moscow's non-cooperation in levering Hanoi's uh, uh, acquiescence in American demands at the negotiating table. And of course, administration concerns about congressional reactions. So there were multiple contributory causes, but the uh, anti-war demonstrations and public concerns about the public were probably uh, primary. Continuing with the list of what's new in the book or what's newly documented, we're confident that we have cited solid evidence that the nuclear alert was connected to Nixon's and Kissinger's concerns about the war in Vietnam. The controversy historically has been uh, between those, a uh, mild controversy, between those who have argued that this alert was called because of uh, the, the Soviet, Sino-Soviet, dispute that was taking place, that perhaps the Nixon administration was concerned that the Soviets would attack China and change the balance of power and so forth. That was, was uh, the consensus view of the small group of people who were dimly aware of the nuclear alert uh, a decade or so ago. And uh, up until the recent publication of a foreign relations of the United States a volume, which uh, implied that the China connection was more important than the Vietnam connection. But we think we have solid evidence. In fact, we're pretty confident we have solid evidence uh, that it was connected to the Vietnam War and Nixon and Kissinger's strategy. We also provide additional documentation for and analysis of the madman theory and the decent interval strategy and how both were, from the beginning, integral 
parts of Nixon's and Kissinger's diplomacy toward the Soviet Union in relation to the Vietnam War. Um, it's perhaps the case that both of these notions, the madman theory and the decent interval strategy are still controversial in some circles, perhaps uh, more so the decent interval strategy. And if any of you don't know what that is, please ask a question and we'd be happy to discuss that uh, issue. Uh, among the many pieces of evidence we cite for the decent interval policy, one comes from statements made by Kissinger just five years ago. He conceded several points on the matter in answer to a question about the policy at a State Department conference in 2010. He said that historical documentation confirms that the administration made statements about the decent interval, that the Paris settlement was a precarious agreement, that the administration was willing to abide by the outcome of a post-diplomatic settlement political contest in South Vietnam between the two warring Vietnamese parties, and that, quote, we could not commit ourselves for all eternity to maintain a government against all conceivable contingencies. So that in, so in that sense, the decent interval phrase has a meaning. Uh, the controversy about the decent interval is basically that the, the administration or Nixon and Kissinger and their allies do not want to admit that that was actually a policy because it suggests that they were willing to give up on the Saigon regime. And of course it was in saving the Saigon regime that supposedly American honor and credibility rested as well as Nixon's credibility. So to admit, to concede that their policy was one that recognized that the war could not be won uh, in such a way that the Saigon regime would be preserved indefinitely was something that the administration did not want to admit. And so much of the opposition today still comes from that camp. Uh, other new or no noteworthy uh, findings in the book, we think, uh, include the following. Nixon's decision to uh, uh, abort the November offensive, as, as Bill mentioned in passing, was the start of a transition in administration strategy. Unable to end the war quickly on their terms through threats and military tactics and actions, Nixon and Kissinger would now attempt to liquidate the U.S. military role in the South by placing more emphasis on another strategy, elements of which uh, had been among their several policy options in 1969. Within the administration, they called this the long route or the long road strategy. It included U.S. troop withdrawals, time to be completed more or less around the time of the 1972 U.S. presidential election, while simultaneously strengthening South Vietnamese armed forces to compensate the U.S. pullout, which we all know as the policy of Vietnamization. Now, what is a little new about what we're saying is that I think the conventional wisdom is that Nixon came into office with an emphasis on de-Americanization and Vietnamization. Indeed, that was one of the options, but in 1969, and this is part of our thesis, they were attempting to end the war more quickly through military threats and the madman theory. And it's not until that failed, or they perceived it to have failed, with Nixon aborting the November option and then launching the nuclear alert, and not winning concessions from Hanoi or getting Moscow's cooperation that they, uh, Nixon committed to this transition to Vietnamization, stretching it out over, over the months. But of course, there were many decisions that had to be made along the way. It's not that simple. At the negotiations in Paris, Kissinger would pursue a strategy aimed at stretching out the talks and winning a settlement that would provide the government of Nguyen Van Thieu of Saigon with a decent chance of surviving for a decent interval after a U.S. exit, an interval of a few years that might preserve the appearance of U.S. honor and credibility as a military guarantor 
of allies and client states. Underpinning all of these policies was Nixon's and Kissinger's conviction that military victory in Vietnam was not feasible. This is another topic that might deserve more discussion and question and answers. But the shift in strategy, uh, as I mentioned, left uh, result of, led to an emphasis on Vietnamization. They st even so, they still regarded military threat making as relevant. And in the years after October 1969, they continued to apply them to their Vietnam exit strategy in other crises and in other crises around the world, but especially in the Middle East. It can be said, however, that the JCS readiness test, or the October nuclear alert of 1969, was one of the last two examples of the Eisenhower, Dulles, Nixon style of nuclear manipulation, but not necessarily the end of nuclear threat making altogether. Today, the operative phrase is, all options are on the table. Considering that, we believe this book to be one that holds important lessons for the present and future about the risks and uncertainties of nuclear threat making. Thank you. So, uh, questions? So the microphones on both sides, you can. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they need you to uh, use the microphones if you have questions. Uh, thanks so much for your very uh, thorough research. I'm noticing in the picture uh, of Nixon, he's seated. Um, is that he's uh, looks like on an airplane? Yes. So Airport part of the madman was he traveling? Have a no, lot? I have no idea what what oh. moment. Uh, it's the publisher who chose this okay. particular picture. Well, I was also others. curious. Um, have you thought at all about Nixon's spiritual uh, background as a society of friends, member of the Quakers, relative to his legacy that some might regard as a fearful legacy via Vietnam and Watergate, where it almost, I mean, I got a sense from what you were saying that some of his policies seem to be also almost, mm, they seem to make no, no sense. And, from a, if you look at the Society of Friends, I mean, they're, it's interesting, they are uh, a group that was started by George yeah. Fox, right, who walked a lot and talked about the idea that God is within all. Right. But the followers, the, the Society of Friends, actually use the, the meeting where they have no leader and they're seated. So and so the idea that he's seated so much is actually having consequences, physiological oh. consequences, oh. too. No, I, I, I think the photo might be in the, uh, in the West Wing, where he, where in the, in the uh, executive office building, where he had an office, because that's like paneling on the side there. Oh, okay. So it might be in the executive office building where Nixon had a private hideaway. Yeah. Okay. But as far as the Quaker thing, I think it didn't have a deep influence on his conduct yeah, as, uh, yeah. as um, a president. <laughs> it's an enigma wrapped in a mystery, or vice versa. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was never aware of the, of the seated seating thing here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We should alternate. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Uh, Bill Burr mentioned uh, Nixon being influenced by Eisenhower and uh, specifically the the uh, threats to end the Korean War and also Lebanon. I was just wondering whether you encountered any uh, Nixon or Kissinger reflections on the Indo-Chinese experience because Eisenhower was also famous for rejecting the advice of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to intervene in Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I just wonder whether that somehow entered into the calculation also. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Nixon spoke several times about the Korean issue. That's, you're asking about that, the Korean claim. Uh, we consider it somewhat dubious. There's a question about whether a message was actually communicated to the Chinese. We discussed this in the book. We have a, a new document or two, right, about this. 
if it was directed to the Chinese, it was really indirect. It was not a forceful threat. And in any case, the study, if you study the Korean War, it didn't have any impact on subsequent operations on the battlefield. So we question whether it actually had a role. However, Nixon did think that it played a role. And he talked about it uh, when he spoke with Southern delegates to the Republican Convention in 1968. It was, uh, it was a, a, a private meeting, but it was taped by the local newspaper, so we know what he said. And he, he used that example to tell the delegates that he knew how to get out of the Vietnam War, and it would be to uh, threaten the use of force and to bring the Soviets in and so forth. So. And, and, and during the, you know, the, the, there was transcripts on the formulations volumes of Nixon and Kissinger talking, and they, they refer explicitly to Del Dulles' use of nuclear threats as, as an example of, what they, of how they conduct themselves towards Hanoi. So there was there something that was on their mind. You know? but, but as far as I know, uh, Eisenhower never made explicit uh, th uh, nuclear threats to save the French in, in Indochina, which of course is the same, the same crew that, uh, that Nixon was uh, trying we, to influence. We have several pages in the book with information that there was planning for the use of nuclear weapons. There was talk at high levels of loaning a couple of bombs to the French. Uh, but somebody doubted whether the French were capable of dropping them. There's a technical <laughs> nuclear taboo right there. Um, but Eisenhower's position was, to the extent you under one understands what Eisenhower was actually thinking, uh, and few people, I think, ever did know what he was really thinking. But it was that the French would have to agree with the US position on certain political arrangements in Vietnam, the end of French colonialism, for example, before the US would join in. Plus, he, he wanted congressional support. He wanted allied support. And by the time they talked about dropping nuclear weapons and worked on all these other questions, the DNB and food crisis was over and the French and the Geneva talks began. So my question is, um, did Nixon in his uh, memoirs at one point, I believe, credits the anti-war movement for uh, being a, maybe the key factor in causing him not to use nuclear weapons. Do you agree with that? Um, he did. Uh, you know, I'd have to look at it again. But he does talk about the movement as as one of the causes. And uh, uh, he, he mentions that it, it undermined the credibility of the whole threat. So yes, yes, he does talk about mm -hmm. that. No, it's, yeah, that's right. Yes? Uh, Dulles was known for brinkmanship. How does that relate to, to this exactly? Dulles' uh, brinkmanship. I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's, the, kind of, it's the kind of thinking that influenced uh, uh, Nixon's approach to the Vietnam issue, sort of bringing, threatening the possibility we'd go to the brink and having the other side think that the president's crazy and try to and terrify them into making diplomatic concessions. So I think, you know, Nixon, Dulles was very, influ had a great influ impact on Dixon, Nixon's thinking. Dick, Nixon met privately with Dulles over the years when they were in office, well, while well, Dulles was living, and I think that had a, you know, he, was, he regarded himself in a way as sort of a student of Dulles's diplomacy. So, so I think there's a connection. Yeah. He saw it as a basic extension and continuation of that then? Well, what, what we yeah. suggest is that the madman theory, which, yeah, yeah. as Nixon explains it to Haldeman, and, and then you, you hear, if you listen to tapes and so on, read documents, it's, it's the th threat of excessive force, uh, uh, extraordinary force under certain circumstances. And it's, that's brinkmanship. So, uh, yeah. What's the most extraordinary, excessive yeah. kind yeah. of force yeah. you could yeah. use yeah. but yeah. going yeah. to the brink? And, and as Bill was saying, Nixon was very much influenced by Eisenhower and, uh, and Dulles. And we, ha we do have this first chapter, which, again, I think is yeah, yeah. the only documented survey of all of these threats from Truman uh, through the Johnson administration. Yeah. Uh, hi. As someone who took part in both moratoriums, if your consensus is it did have something to do with peace, that's very... <laughs> reassuring to me, although I was just one of millions. Uh, my question is this. 
If you were to take a scale, and we'll put uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the top because of atomic weapons were used there, maybe the Cuban Missile Crisis is a two. How serious in your research did you find this to be? Uh, more talk, I mean, you know, could you rate it in such a, in such a way? Wait, what, the oh, October oh. alert? Or yeah, yeah. in other words, you know, where, would it, yeah. where would it fit, yeah. fit you know, was it just that serious? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, there's always a risk that when you're putting your forces on higher alert, um, flying nuclear-armed bombers over Alaska, and, and stuff like that, that, you're, that might create misimpre misimpressions on the other side, that the Russians might think that if something's going to happen, we have to prepare. There could be mixed signals and misunderstandings um, leading to, you know, inadvertent military action and a real crisis. Um, but they, they, you know, they sort of calibrated the thing, so it was designed to, so the Soviets would notice it, but not such a high level of readiness that they would be alarmed. So they, but there's still a little risk. But in terms of comparing it to Cuba and, and others, it's certainly, you know, no, the risk was fairly, I think, fairly low, you know, on the, yeah. on the whole. You know. Well, but, you know. But tell them what we think, or you think, is the, the most dangerous. Oh, I think, you know, Cuba, you know, by far, yeah. would, yeah. it's probably the most, you know, the most dangerous. I mean, when the Korean War was, the Chinese intervened in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the Korean War, and, and Truman goes on, on uh, at a press conference and talks about using nuclear weapons. And of course, he had to walk that back very quickly. It was a very dangerous period um, in terms of the risk of escalation of Russians getting involved, perhaps. Uh, but Cuba, by far, I think, was the most serious. Yeah, the Soviets know, went on alert, too. Yeah, the Soviets went on alert several times yeah. during the missile crisis, and they went on a very high alert. Uh, and, they, and they took little precautionary actions during October 69, but just, they were, you know, they're, they're, they're just look, watching and raising readiness of a few forces here and there, and their intelligence apparatus was in high gear, but, but nothing like, and the, nothing the like Berlin, the Berlin, the Berlin yeah. crisis with yeah. Eisenhower, yeah. Mm -hmm. wasn't, there was oh. a significant alert, too. Oh, the, the, the Paris summit of yeah. 1960, yeah. but that was... Um, May Day, too, everything. Well, after the, after the U2 crisis, mm -hmm. that's right. There was, a, there was a DEFCON 3, I think, uh, and DEFCON 3 in the October War of 73. But those were, you know, yeah. but all compared to, compared to Cuba, they were much less risky. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. You mentioned that your book is based on documentation and information that has come to light recently through uh, declassification and so on, but that you had a notion, anyway, what was the nature of that information. Okay. Now that that stuff is uh, declassified, I wonder what you, how you would describe what you think remains classified and what issues that may address. Uh, well, uh, some really good documents, for example, documents on the mining readiness tests that we got, where they're all from you know, Melvin Laird's top secret office files when he was Secretary of Defense. They're still on process, on, on cl cl classified records held at the Records mm -hmm. Center in, in Suitland. But I was able to get a list of the records and put some requests in for declassification of some files and was able to get some stuff. But there's a real problem with a backlog of you know, defense records mm -hmm. at the high level. But there's, in terms of what could be still classified, I think, well, the, the signals intelligence reporting of the Soviet reactions, you get the documents or pages and pages of blacked out pages. Uh, these are all signals intelligence, this stuff that the NSA doesn't want to release. Um, and of course, you know, Kissinger holds records. Oh, yeah. Kissinger, yeah. Kissinger holds personal records of his meeting with Nixon. He kept detailed notes of his meetings with Nixon, mm -hmm. their day to day discussions uh, before they were taping anything, before Nixon was taping anything. So there's lots of, well, there's a lot to be learned, I think, about. And, you know, and he deposited in the Library of Congress his own notes of meetings with his aides. And we, we have one little quote yeah. from one of those uh, yeah. transcripts <laughs> in which Kissinger actually uses the term madman. He's telling his aides, we need yeah. a plan yeah. Yeah. that yeah. portrays the president as a madman. Yeah. But we can't get all the rest of them. I and mean, this would be very interesting. In, in planning the, <coughs> excuse me, the November option, mm -hmm. the duck hook as we know it, plan, uh, he set up what was rumored to be a September group, this is in September, September group, and uh, had these meetings with them. So those notes are not available. What I would also like to see in answer to your question, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, Bill, maybe you understand this fully, but I, I don't. Uh, 
the difference between the duck hook plan, in other words, the concept that was being developed in the White House by the September group under Kissinger, and then the, the pruning knife plan that the JCS group was arranging. And it, it's a little difficult, I think, to figure out what is really the difference between those two plans. And so why didn't the JCS group like the concept in the White House, and why didn't the White House like the pruning knife plan? And I think it was that the pruning knife group that had initial operations that were much more powerful and dangerous than what the White House was planning. The White House wanted a plan that started with shock and awe, but would gradually escalate. In other words, there would be intervals of bombing and, and mining and so forth, and then they would measure the North Vietnamese reaction or the Soviet reaction, and if they didn't react appropriately, then they would escalate. But my point here is I'm not sure really what the difference between the two plans were, except that the military, uh, that is the Joint Chiefs, did not think that the Duck Hook plan was, had uh, a proper military objectives. And the White House, Kissinger, Kissinger, did not think that the JCS was providing objectives, targets to hit that would have the desirable diplomatic and political uh, results. But see, I'd like, I'd like the documents that clarify this yeah. in detail. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. Just a short one. I know you, you, did, you did bring out most of the triad, the subs, the planes and stuff, but uh, I'm not seeing a lot about the ICBMs. Good uh, question. Uh, did they pop the lid? They're already on such high alert routinely that they couldn't do anything more. So they just they said, we'll focus on bombers and other kinds of forces. But the ICBMs were already on, on you know, 30 second or one minute readiness. Solid rocket fuel brings that so revolution. So they couldn't do, yeah. there's no signaling they could use of the ICBMs. And that'd probably be far too dangerous. Yeah, well, that is tantamount, that's paramount to declaring war, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. This, this well, tells us something about this whole episode leading up to the November option, is that they wanted something that would shock something that would threaten in a mad sort of way, yet they stepped back. They had a little, they had a little wiggle room. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Yes. Thank you. I just one question on, on the, the madman theory, and I, so I'm aware of that before. I heard of that approach before. I knew Nixon's affinity for it, for the approach, but I was unaware of the 69 alert as a preeminent example of that theory. But are there other examples of this where we try to use the same theory in other events in history beyond the 69 alert? I'm not sure I understand that. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm are, there, yeah. are there other ways, other attempts where clearly an effort by Nixon to use the madman theory oh, oh, yeah, yeah, to yeah, change yeah, yeah, policy? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there was a, a crisis in Jordan in uh, 1970, and uh, Nixon... Uh, uh, was in Chicago talking to newspaper paper editors, and he chose the moment to say to them that sometimes the Soviets need to think that they're dealing with a madman uh, to get some results. And uh, Peter Lissagor, you may know, remember that name, famous journalist at the time, wrote up the story in the Chicago Sun-Times at a time when there were several editions of newspapers. And, uh, and so we, we know what Nixon said at that meeting, but uh, from, the, from Air Force One, the story was killed, and there's now no record of that. But there were threats of that sort made to, uh, to shape the situation. And then, uh, the well, Def, tell, them, tell them about DEFCON 3. And then the October War. Uh uh, the Soviets made sort of a, what was thought to be a veiled threat of intervention in the, in the Middle East. And Nixon, and Kissinger and the NSC met, met in the middle of the night to discuss Brezhnev's response. And they, uh, Nixon was out of action. Agnew had just resigned. Nixon was in, a bad, was in bad shape. So they went ahead and they ordered a DEFCON 3, uh, which is you know not like the missile crisis, DEFCON 2, but high, higher level of alert. 
put the, put the Soviets on notice. And of course, it's, and that's a good, another example. And, and, and if you read the Fruce volume, where they have the minutes of the meeting, you can see history explicitly using madman style type rhetoric to explain and justify uh, raising the alert level. But, but I, I do want to add also yeah, that yeah. Uh, many of you may know uh, or remember line, the linebacker operations in 1972, linebacker yeah, one yeah. and linebacker two. Christmas bombing. The Christmas bombing. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, what, what we consider to be the mythical story and claim uh, by Nixon and Kissinger and others is that that linebacker operation, which 12-day bombing uh, around Hanoi, in and around Hanoi, and Haiphong, uh, the reseeding of mines uh, along the North Vietnamese coast in Haiphong, that that is what brought the North Vietnamese back to the table and won for the Nixon administration this, this wonderful agreement, the Paris Agreement. Uh, but actually, uh, I, I don't want to get into the details. You'll have to read the book. But it was really probably the last gasp of Nixon wanted, excuse my language, but this is what he said, to bomb the bastards. And he, he, wanted, he, he, he had been wanting to do that for a long time. And also, it was kind of a signal to the right, the American political right, that he had gotten out of this war with a, a questionable agreement, uh, not a victory. But he had gotten out of that war. He had forced the other side to agree to it by using all this force. And that is, to, to this very day, I think, the dominant mythology about how the war ended, that Nixon, with by threatening all this violence, madman theory, and so forth, that he had forced the other side, oh, yeah, 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 we'll sign the Paris Agreement. So that's another example. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. I think during your primary talk, one of you indicated that the North Vietnamese had refused to be cowed by one of the threats. The first question, which threat was it you were speaking of, or was it all of them? And two, have other liberation movements is there any evidence that other movements have learned from that refusal to be cowed? Uh, wait, 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 don't, oh. don't go away, because yeah. what's, what's that? Well, I'm not sure about the first question. Well, I, thought, uh, well, I think I uh, Yeah, which, 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 which threat was it that the North Vietnamese refused to be cowed by? Oh, well, the okay. mining operation, they didn't really, it, the mining readiness test, which was, it's not clear that it, whether, whether it was noticed by the North Vietnamese um, but you know, through through Doreen and Kissinger was making statements threatening veiled escal you know threatening escalation of some sort, and that those threats were obviously were conveyed to the North Vietnamese by the Soviets. Anything that Kissinger said about Vietnam was probably conveyed. Sure. Uh, so there were all kinds of low-level threats being made. Well, begin with the Cambodia yeah. bombing, yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah, and the Cambodia bombing. Uh, that was a big deal to Nixon and Kissinger and, and to all of us, uh, and uh, they thought that this would signal the North that he was capable of anything and he might escalate further and even attack North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they were concerned about it, but they weren't going to be cowed by it, to answer your question. So every, every other operation, if you recall the, uh, the uh, well, the invasion of Cambodia as well, uh, the next year, and in 1971, uh, US support of the South Vietnamese army going into Laos was another example. Nixon also escalated the bombing in the demilitarized zone um, for military purposes, but it was also a signal that he was capable of anything. And your second question was, did this undermine the credibility of threat making with other groups? Is, is there any evidence, and maybe this isn't part of your book, that, that other, quote, liberation, unquote, movements have learned from the uh, North Vietnamese stance? I don't think we have evidence. I th we do make a statement, though, that uh, we, we suggest uh, that nuclear threats or threats against uh, revolutionary groups, guerrilla groups, are just not credible. They're disproportionate. Uh, and this goes back to, uh, I'm trying to think of the French thinker, military thinker, who pointed this out back in the 1950s, that uh, the, the revolutionary in the jungle or in the urban streets is not is so committed to his or her cause that uh, such a threat is just not credible or it doesn't matter. 
Thanks. Yes. Any evidence that either President Johnson or Nixon ever ex accepted that Vietnam was a mistake? I think what they would say is that, uh, yes, it was a mistake, but it was Kennedy's fault and Johnson's fault, and that he was trying to get out of it. And that, that's the official line, I think. Yeah. But, I, but no, I think, I think they acknowledge that. How could they avoid it? But they didn't believe military victory was possible. Why? Because it was not, as we, the shorthand phrase, cost effective. You would have to send more troops in, more casualties. Economically, it would be harmful and so forth. So yes, it was a mistake in that sense. And that's what they thought. <clears throat> Did you find any evidence that uh, Nixon and Kissinger in, in uh, planning this escalating threat worried about a preemptive strike by the Russians? No, nothing, that, that's not, nothing like that, I don't think. Um, they didn't think the Russians would, would take those kinds of risk um, for, for the, for, over yeah. Vietnam. Um, nothing, like, nothing that occurs to me. No, no, no. Thank you. No, thank you. Folks, there is a book signing one level up in the Archives bookstore. We will meet you up there in just a few moments.